This is Heart of the Matter, the short show. I'm Sean McCraney, your host. This is an open response to Brother Jeff Durbin and Pastor Jason Wallace. Uh, in Arizona, there's a very popular ministry called Apologia Ministries. I think it's called Ministries. It's run by a brother named Jeff Durbin, who's an outspoken criti critic of mine. Last week, and in conjunction with uh, having Pastor Jason Wallace of Magna Orthodox Presbyterian Church as his guest, Jeff did a show that was titled Cults, Apostasy, and Sean McCraney. And at the 22-minute mark of a nearly 90-minute show, Jeff and his two co-hosts, Luke and Joy, entered into their attack upon me personally and the ministry that we have. Now, some of the information that they offered up was accurate, and uh, much of it was, uh, were partial truths that were discussed out of context, which is typically the way it works uh, with me. Because there's so much context, it's really hard. So you got to take sound bites and you build a premise off those sound bites. A good deal of their statements were completely unfounded. And I want to simply state, for the record, that I understand um, the state of mind uh, that these brothers and this sister have uh, when it comes to me and what I'm all about. Um, they claim I'm trying to be uh, Joseph Smith. That is not the, the case. Uh, they mock, they say I, I uh, or Jason Wallace says that I receive revelations from the Lord. And just to say that statement sounds like it. But what I mean by that is that God talks to me like God talks to you. I think God talks to all of his creations and his children especially. It doesn't mean I'm receiving revelation for anybody. I've never said that or claimed that I'm receiving revelation for you to believe. That's a mistruth, and it's misguiding. It's unfair. Um, and uh, uh, they mock me for the fact that I change in my views over the years. They see this as a fail. Now, Apologia and Pastor Wallace embrace a form of the faith called Reformed Theology, and uh, which is really founded in Augustine and, and Calvin. And they claim that their orthodoxy represents the unassailable truth of what, the, what Christianity is over the past 2,000 years. And that this is Jesus' truth, the truth of his church, and it continues forward through uh, them and, and men like them and women, and it's unassailable. There's, there's no question on any doctrinal position. They have it, and therefore you don't question it. Along I come and challenge some things that they hold sacred. And of course, this troubles them, especially from that mindset, which I understand. They have that mindset. It's like when I was Mormon. I had the mindset. This is what truth is. You don't have the truth. I have the truth. It was restored. You're wrong. I'm right. That's the mindset you get when it comes to embracing something that you consider orthodox and right for 2,000 years, right? So um, they criticize the, the challenges, and, and rightfully so. There have been times when I have been uh, uh, challenged in the wrong way. And I've used the wrong words. I mean, I've been doing this 14 years and I, or more, 15 years, and I've, I've had to cut my teeth on how to approach things and how to say things. And so I can see them taking umbrage to uh, me being too accusatory or too attacking. I try not to do it on persons. I have done it on persons. I try to do it on concepts, but I get their point. And I get it because I honestly believe that these people... Jeff and Jason and his cohorts believe what they're saying. They, they, they mean well. They believe they represent God and his ways and wisdom in this day and age. What might be overlooked here is that one way to live the Christian faith is to take a set of principles, rules, doctrines, dogmas that have been presumably handed down to be taught those dogmas and to accept them as absolutely true. That's what we do when we embrace denominationalism. When we find a denomination that we like, we take its teachings, 
we're Wesleyan, we're this, we're that, we're Calvinists, we're Mormon, we're Catholic. We take the teachings that have been handed down and we just say, okay, I've studied them or I haven't. I accept them as true. All right. And I understand that is the way most people do this in this day and age. Um, this is what Jeff and Jason have done and do, but it is also what the Catholics do. It's what orthodoxy does. It's what all of Protestantism does and all its variations. And it's what the Restorationist churches like Mormonism and Seventh-day Adventists and all of them, all of them do this, okay? Admittedly, I believe God loves all of them as they amble forth with their body of truths that they say are irrefutable. Now, I know that Jeff and Jason and, and James White, they're all the, pretty much the same group. They believe that they have the unassailable truth. So with that comes the zealous fervency to attack those who approach the Christian walk in a different way. Now, that's not good if they find someone who approaches Christianity in a different way. They believe, again, that their way, the orthodox way, is the only way to approach it. So I've learned another way. I've taught myself another way. I've come to see the failures in the way that they've embraced. And, uh, and so it's the way I have learned to walk in the faith. And that is to keep a light touch on things that are handed down. I'll look at them. I'll hear them. I've embraced some of them. But to keep a light touch and to read the Bible, hopefully by the Spirit, sometimes not, hopefully by it, line upon line, and make sure that it supports from the, first, from the place I'm reading all the way out to each end what the, what the concepts are. So if I read one line in the Scripture and it doesn't, isn't supported by the rest of it, I can't embrace that line as a doctrinal truth, no matter what men or women say. And, and so um, I try to avoid the influences of man and their traditions telling me in advance what I need to see and believe. Now, sure, I've been affected by traditions and even embraced some, but at the end of the day, if they are challenged in my mind by the Spirit, hopefully, when I'm reading scripture, when they are challenged by segments and I look at both all the way to through both ends, the best of my ability, and I see that they aren't upheld by a contextual understanding of what I'm reading, I say, I'm not going to revere them. I'm not going to hold them up as absolute. Even though the systems have tried to teach us that this is absolute, it doesn't matter to me. It's never mattered to me. I don't care what the systems say. This is reprehensible to somebody who's embraced orthodoxy. And again, I understand that. In the past, I have been more mocking. And I might be in the future because I'm a man of flesh. But I get it. So when someone takes this approach to seeking God in Christ, a number of disconcerting things happen to the minds of those who have embraced orthodoxies. One is that one of the things that happens when you embrace the way I've done it is that you will, you must change. You're going to change your mind about things. This is night and day from orthodoxy, you see. You don't have the right to change your mind about things in orthodoxies as they're passed down, whether it's Greek, Russian, Catholic, Protestant, Mormon, whatever it is that's passed down. You don't get to change your mind if, it, if, if your mind change is outside of what orthodoxies claim as, as, as impervious truth, right? So I have, I will change my mind. That's a big book you're trying to figure things out through, right? And so as you read it and, and, you're, and, and you change your mind, you might come to another place where that reveals something else and you'll see, wow, I've got to change my mind again. That is viewed by orthodoxy as a weakness, as a failure of the man or the woman. Because remember, they, up, they support mindsets that don't change. It's the old North Star idea that, you know, this is it, 
stick to it. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have things I haven't stuck to. I have always stuck to Jesus as the way, truth, and the life. And there's no way to the Father but by him. And that he was born a a virgin and he lived a perfect life and he died on a cross and he resurrected on the third day. I have never, ever, ever, ever diverted from that. I never will unless I fall so terribly. But uh, I have never changed my mind on that and I stick to that. And that's what the gospel is. So while I'm being called an apostate and, and, and all these different names and things, I've never changed my mind on what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. I've just changed my mind about some ancillary things that no one really can say is absolute. They try, but they can't. And when someone comes along and says, yeah, I just don't see it that way, that's anathematic to uh, an Orthodox person. My brothers and sisters here, they see me as as a weakness. They see me as full of contradiction because I am willing to change my views and to go another way. Um, so when I come along and I receive, uh, then reject certain views, um, they see this as that laughable weakness. They'll take video, which I have. See, that's the other thing is that I've just said where I'm at. This is what I see. This is what I think. I have not tried to organize a systematic religion that is uh, perfect. I'm a human being. And so we record things. I teach as I go. But, you know, as you go along, you're going to change. So you have one recording where I'm saying one thing, and you have another recording where I'll say another. I have never been ashamed of changing my mind. They'll take the different uh, uh, views, and they'll compare them and say, look at this contradictory hypocrite who's unlearned, etc., etc. And I am. I'm contradictory. I am unlearned. And I can be a hypocrite. Uh, but nevertheless, I am a seeker. And anytime we have sat down to record anything, I give you my honest, heartfelt interpretation of what is there. I've never tried to manipulate or strategize so that I can look consistent so that people can build their faith and trust upon me and my ability to logically reason through things and build that empire of orthodoxy. That's not what I'm about. I would be doing, I would be lying to God. I would be lying to you if I presented myself in any other way. So when orthodoxy meets someone like me, I become their target because I am anathematic to what they believe. They want that foundation that men have presented. One of those topics is eternal punishment. One of those topics is the Trinity. And uh, one of those topics is what the resurrection looked like and what it looks like. One of those topics is eschatology. When did Jesus come back? And when in my mind, by the Spirit, I hope, I see the, the preponderance of evidence that weighs against what Orthodox traditions have said, I will, God with me giving me any sort of strength, say, I think you're wrong. There's a price for that. And the price comes out in these types of videos. So they see the sign of strength is to make a stand on something that has been passed down. I see a sign of strength as being willing to challenge things that have been passed down that don't make sense, right? And so when you go against the grain, and you go against what has made sense to even thousands, millions, billions of people for thousands of years, which they say this is their strength, um, you're going to be viewed as somebody who is, uh, you know, just another person kicking against the pricks and who is going to fall in ignominity. I don't care if I fall in ignominity or not. I am being honest with what I see and what is there. So on this, I have always stood and have not varied in any way. Uh, and uh, the thing about the approach that I'm taking also is that we don't, we aren't blessed with living apostles, unlike what the Mormons say. We haven't been, there's no first hand witnesses of Jesus' resurrection around with us today. And we don't have the living Lord walking with us to really tell us when we question something, Lord, what about this? The Orthodox say we have the scripture, 
But what that has led to, and I've repeated this many times, is Catholics, Orthodoxy, Protestants, Reformation, Restoration, arguments, division, right? That's what the scripture does. And, and so my suggestion is that it's not sola scriptura. It is sola spiritus with sola scriptura right there as a partner. But the spirit is primary. And the way that I have always taught this, at least in the past five years, is if you take a doctrine and your interpretation of that doctrine does not amount to agape love in your life, you have misinterpreted that doctrine. Because I don't think God can be inconsistent with the things he teaches and it being in confrontation to agape love. So that is the method by which I uh, go and I interpret scripture. Does the teaching that I am giving about a doctrine lend to an understanding and a practice of agape love? So when it comes to elements of the faith that the Apologia people see as concrete, I obviously see them as more sandy. Some of the things are absolutely true. And, and I think on the essentials, we agree, even though they would say that's not the case. And things are not as irrefutable as orthodoxies maintain. This disregard uh, for my approach to things uh, has caused them to take the whole of my person and the teachings that we do and to label me five times in the video, dangerous, very dangerous. Um, it caused Brother Jason Wallace to say that I am at times the most vicious man imaginable end quote. Um, and it has caused them to say that I reject the coming judgment of God for every individual. That is not true. They say that I reject the resurrection. That is not true at all. I believe the resurrection. I just don't see it in the same terms they do. And a host of other things like eschatology and the Trinity, the Trinity and, and, and they, they, make, they make statements, and I understand why, because they're orthodox, that, that say things like, well, if you don't understand the Trinity, then you don't understand uh, who you're worshiping, therefore you're not a Christian. And I have yet to find someone who really understands the Trinity. Really. So we have a lot of Christians who aren't Christians out there. I don't think it's that tough, you know. So I am responding to the repeated claims that I'm a dangerous man and the most vicious man imaginable, and their use of our copyrighted material uh, officially. It's coming down the line. But with the rest of it, it comes with the territory. To be called an apostate, to be called a cult leader, to be called all those things in the negative sense, right? I just want to end this response with the following. Where you see tradition as a value to your beliefs, I see them in my life as a weakness. I'm not saying you're weak. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, Jeff, or Jason, or Joy, or Luke, or any of the hundreds of people who of the 8,000 views in a matter of a couple days are writing the negative things that they're saying. I understand your perspective. I really do. And with those perspectives and even the pejorative terms you're using toward me, I do love you. I'm a man. I make mistakes. I have made mistakes. I will uh, uh, attack wrongly. I will say things out of turn. That's what men and women do. But my heart is always to try to do the Lord's will, even though sometimes I will fail. I place my faith completely in Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of my faith. You do not have access to the Father but by Him in any way. They talk about the uh, total reconciliation and they mock that as a form of universalism. I've never taught any element of universalism as with universalism saying, hey, uh, there's other ways to the Father but Jesus. Never. He's the only way. So when you see the written word as primary and that you will debate over it and talk, I see it as secondary. I see the Spirit as primary because the fruit of the Spirit is love, and that is what God seeks from us. And I see the written word as serving to be somewhat di uh, divisionary among us. Pastor Wallace stated that I promise our, anyone who listens to me liberty, but I put them into bondage. That is what he said. That's a quote. He promises them liberty, 
but he puts them in bondage. And I would just openly and, and gently ask how. I would like someone to come forward and show how the, my approach to this and the teachings have put anybody in bondage other than the bondage to love, which is something that is emphatic. You've got to err in love. That People can say, you put me in bondage to that. I might say, well, God did, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be guilty of that. But the implication is that I'm putting them in, in bondage to a church, to, to practices, to all sorts of things, you know. That's the implication of I put them in bondage. And I find that, that, that comment kind of unfair. And so I openly ask, how have I done that? And find somebody that will validate this claim that I've put anybody into any kind of bondage, all right? In the end, I want these people to know that in the face of their attack and their unauthorized and uncontextual use of our copyrighted materials uh, that they use to paint me in a certain way, I embrace them as brothers and sisters in the Lord, orthodox or not, and I believe that uh, God loves them with all of his heart. I give them the benefit of the doubt that they love God. I do see them as dinosaurs in the faith. And I mean that n dinosaurs are nice creatures. I mean, kids love dinosaurs, right? But they are going extinct. And I mean that kindly. Your way is going extinct in this world because your dogmas are not being upheld by reasonable thinking people or the Bible. And what you stand on and demand and, and, and attack other people about if they differ with you, those ways are going away. And I care too much about the faith and about individuals, human beings. God so loved this world, he gave his son. I care too much about this gospel to let it go the way of this we have it right, you are wrong, you're going to hell, you're an apostate, and, and all of this stuff. Now, we've had divisions in the past between us. I'm sorry, I probably will make more mistakes in the future. I am no one to follow. I don't ask anyone to follow me, I never have. I ask for people to consider the things I teach and to test them and to walk away from anything that is not supported by a, a sound, reasonable, spirit-filled uh, message from Scripture. That's my point. I have invited Jeff, you on the show, numerous times. You don't even respond. And, and there's a reason for that. We're going to wrap it up with this. Orthodoxy says, when one brother or sister has gone and, and approached another, and that person doesn't embrace what that person has to say, there's no reason for anybody else to do it. And Jeff stands on that biblical practice that was established in the, Old, in the New Testament by Paul and, and others, right? So what Jeff says is James White and, and Jason Wallace have come to Sean and been on his show, and we've talked about certain things. That gives me the right to never talk to him and to attack him constantly without ever having an opportunity to hear him out with what he has to say relative to my concerns. That is orthodoxy at play. That says, this Bible justifies me in this behavior. I want to suggest that you come on the show and you bring up your, your concerns to me, you, and I'll express my responses and that we help unite the faith rather than to tear it apart. Because brother, I am of the faith. I pray all day long. I study scripture. I try to live my life selflessly by the Spirit. I trust in the living God. I know Jesus is the only way. I mean, you could go, I believe in a resurrection for all people. I know there's a final judgment for all people. My differences are, I just don't see eternal punishment, eschatology, or your, the Trinity in the same way you do. And for that, you have labeled me uh, an apostate, a dangerous man, the most vicious person you can imagine. And I think that's unfair. Write your comments below. We'll get to them on our Tuesday night show here on Heart of the Matter.